Good morning, everyone. In this beautiful day of Rosh Chodesh Iyar, Ani Hashem Rofecha, I am God, your healer. It's a pleasure to be gathered again together and to continue on our topic of Mashiach. I want to tell you uh, something that happened last week with the video is that uh, in all the videos of our Monday, night, Monday morning classes, it's the video that got the most views and the most comments. I had to erase most of the comments, but uh, it was very interesting to see that there's an awakening in the world. People see the word Mashiach, they, they're just, uh, you know, ready. There's a sensitivity, there is a, uh, um, a desire to know more, especially when we stand in times where the world is uh, very, very unstable. So, last week we spoke about the fact that the, what will happen when Mashiach comes, what's going to happen with the reality of the world. I'm going to sum it up with a mashal, with a, um, a parable. We certainly all saw these pictures which are made of dots or letters, especially in Tzfat. If you go to Tzfat, they'll make a whole picture made of little dots or little letters. And what's interesting is that when you are far from the picture, you're able to see the picture and appreciate the picture. Once you come close to the picture, the closer you come to the picture, the less you see the picture. It's like being the forest. When you're far away from the forest, you see a forest. When you're in the forest, you uh, barely see a forest. You just see trees. But you don't feel, you don't see the whole forest. Well, we explained that now our reality is so physical and so involved in the physical world that we do not perceive what's happening behind the scenes, so to say. As it says in the Pasuk, Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. At the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't say Yud Ke Vav Ke. It does not say Bereshit bara Monai, Hashem. But rather it says Elohim. Elohim and Hashem are two types of revelations of Hashem. Or should I say two types of channels through which Hashem expresses Himself. Hashem Yud Ke Vav Ke is above nature, above anything natural, it's completely the spiritual dimension, while Elohim, Elohim in Hebrew has a numerical value of 86, which is the same numerical value for the word Hateva, which is nature. So it's all about nature. So the world, Elohim, hides the presence of Hashem. So that's why it says in the Pasuk, in the verse in chapter 84 of Tehillim, Ki shemesh umagen Hashem Elohim. Just like the sun has its shield, so too God, Yudke Vavke, has the name Elohim to be able to shield His light in order that we should be able to handle the light of God. So God, so to say, hides Himself in the reality of this world, in nature. And that's why the name Elohim has a, uh, uh, it's a word that's plural, while Hashem is singular. Because there are many facets that hide God, reveal God within nature, but it's a multifaceted. When you see the origin of everything, you see that really at the source and the vitality of everything is one. So what will happen when Mashiach comes? Basically, we're going to get closer to Hashem and we will not see the concealment anymore. And as a result, what we will appreciate more is the godly light, the vitality of everything and not the physicality within everything. 
Imagine it's just like eating a peach, right? A peach, a good, beautiful, ripe, juicy, uh, sweet peach. What is peachy about the peach? It's the taste. That's what makes it exciting. The taste of the peach. So it's not so much the uh, texture, the way it's made, but it's the taste that's exciting. So we will have more a glimpse into the taste, more than the physical object through which we are feeling the taste. Now, at the beginning of creation, it says, Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim et ha-aretz. At the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, so He hid Himself in the world, in that reality which is called nature. Ve-ha-aretz aita to'u vavou v'choshech al pene tehom. Interesting. We look at the words to'u and bohu, which is chaos and and uh, 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 a situation of lack of order, and darkness on the abyss. There are four expressions here. What's very interesting is that our sages say in the Midrash that these are the four, represent the four exiles of the Jewish people. The exile to Babylonia, the exile to Madai, the exile to Yavan, which is Greece, the Greek exile, and the exile of Edom, right, which is the one we are in now. And basically, right, uh, right as we are living these exiles, after that, the Pasuk, the verse continues in Genesis and says, Veruach Elohim merahefet al amayim. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So our sages explain what is that Spirit of God which was hovering over the waters. Zeruho shel Moshiach. This was the Spirit of Moshiach. So what does that mean? It means that at the beginning of creation, before the world was created, exile was already created. And not only exile was created, but Mashiach was created already before the world. I once had a discussion, I was 16 years old. I remember where I was standing. I was standing at uh, the corner of Bourette and Decari in Montreal, talking to my best friend, and we were talking back and forth, and uh, we had some serious questions. What is the purpose of the world? And then, this verse that I just quoted popped up to my mind, in my mind. And I said to him, Daniel, if the Spirit of God hovered over the waters is before the creation of the world, then it must be that that's the ultimate purpose of creation of the world. What exactly is Moshiach? What is it? It's the ultimate state of fusion between man and God, between world and God, between man and himself at his highest spiritual potential, but in a way that it's infinite. Meaning that whatever levels you reach, you are never going to be fully uh, complete which means you, we will attain certain levels of understanding, of connection, of fusion, and then we will think, ah, this is the end, I've reached the optimum. And then God will show you that there's another layer of you, there's another layer of Him, there's a deeper self, there's a deeper level of God, 
and slowly but surely we will look at what we did yesterday and we will have a new appreciation for today. But it's going to be a very pleasant experience. It's not the experience where you feel, oh, I'm discouraged because there's so many levels. No, every level will be new. To give you a good example of this, Baruch Hashem, God has blessed me with grandchildren. So when your grandchildren are, um, are away, they don't live in the same city, for example, and you get pictures, especially in the first years and the first months, every day it's a new picture. It's a new aspect. It's a new development. Something else was said. It was a little sound. It was a movement. And then slowly but surely, the cognitive capacity of the child grows. Then they start expressing themselves. Then you start understanding them. They imagine that this is what's going to happen at the time when Mashiach comes. Where we, with our understanding, are going to grow and grow and grow and not stop growing. And the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. This is what takes us out of the different, the four different exiles. Now, how do we connect to the Spirit of Mashiach? What is Mashiach? Is it just a world situation that's going to change? Is it an individual? How does it work? In order for us to have a little understanding in what's going to happen and how that process happens, we have to look at the Zohar Kadosh. The Zohar explains that the world needs a process, needs to go through a process of preparation in order to be able to receive the light of Mashiach, and in order for that individual, which is called Mashiach, which is the king, to reveal himself. Let's explain. The Midrash says that the world will exist for 6,000 years. As it says and states in the verse, Ki elef shanim be'enecha keyom etmol. God a thousand years, a, 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 a day in your, a day for you is a, is, has the value of a thousand years. What does it mean has the value of a thousand years? Well, you created the world in six days. On the seventh you rested. We will have six thousand years of creation. And on the sixth one, right, on the, in, the, in the seventh millennium, we will rest. This will be the eternal Shabbat. The Shabbat, which will be the time of Mashiach, of Geula. Now, we all know that it's not possible to just go into Shabbat. We need to prepare for Shabbat. We need to buy the food. Already from Wednesday, according to Halakha, according to Jewish law, we can already we wish one another Shabbat Shalom. Thursday, we buy the food for Shabbat, and we start cooking, and Friday, it more, gets more intense as Shabbat, as Friday afternoon gets closer, it gets more intense. And then, before Shabbat comes in, 18 minutes before, or even already much before that, an hour and a quarter before that, you can light the Shabbat candles and accept the Shabbat upon yourself. Well, so it is true, true as well concerning the Geulah, concerning the redemption. We are now in the year 5782, which would mean that 218 years from now is the 7th millennium. So one might think, I have to wait another 218 years. Who knows if I'll be able, even with all the technology, to live that long. I might feel that old, but I don't know if I'm going to live that long. So, you have to know that really Mashiach 
is already coming much before that. Once we are on Friday, we are already ready and able to accept the Shabbat. If you look at the numerical value of the word Ner in Hebrew, which is the candle, the candles of Shabbat, it's the numerical value of 250, which means that from the year 1990, which corresponds to the year 5750, 250 years between before we enter the Shabbat, we are already at a state where we light the candles and we are ready for Moshiach to reveal himself. But there's a process because something which is so magnanimous as the revelation of God and the supernal knowledge of Hashem to every one of us cannot happen in the world which is not physically ready. Now, there is a verse which we say every day, Az When Mashiach comes, the trees will be singing to God. Our sages explain what trees are we referring to. We are referring to the two trees. The tree of knowledge of good and bad, which was in the Garden of Eden, and Etz HaHayim, and the tree of life, which was in the Garden of Eden as well. Now, these two trees represent two dimensions in knowledge. The tree of good and bad represent the tree of science, of secular knowledge. While the tree of life represents the tree of Torah knowledge, the tree of holy knowledge, right? The knowledge of God. What will happen at the time of Moshiach is that the world, the scientific world, and the godly world will be in a perfect unison. Everything will be united in a way that we will be able through the eyes of science to see godliness. And through the eyes of godliness we'll understand the deeper levels of science. Now, when does this process start exactly? We said there are six thousand years, six millenniums. Our sages teach us the two first millenniums till Abraham Avinu, till Abraham our forefather were millenniums of Tohu, of chaos. The second millenniums, the two millenniums from Abraham uh, to Moshe and so on are the time that we are celebrating Torah, two millenniums of Torah knowledge, and the two last millenniums, which is Thursday and Friday, we are in Yemot HaMashiach, in the times of Moshiach. Now, in the times of Moshiach itself, there is a time of preparation, as we said, we prepare the food for Shabbat, well, we prepare the world for Mashiach. When exactly does it start? The Zohar HaKadosh says, concerning the verse in the parasha of Noah, if you remember the story of Noah, Noah was in his ark. Noah lived through the Mabul, through the flood. And the Torah says, Bishnat shesh meot shana lehaye Noach. On the 600th year of life, of the life of Noach, Niftechu arubot hashamay vechol mayanot tehom nivkeu. It's not exactly the verse, I'm not quoting it uh, verbatim. It says that all the sources of water from the earth opened up and the heavens opened up and poured all its water just like we have in florida here when it starts when it rains it pours here but it did this for 40 days and 40 nights 
Now what's interesting is that in order to flood the whole world with water, we needed both sources of water. If you're going to ask <clears throat> where did this water go afterwards, just as a parenthesis, right? The Sforno says that at the beginning of creation, till Noah, till the flood, the world stood straight, not on an axle, not inclinated. And therefore, the weather in the whole world was a tropical weather. What happened is that with the phenomenon of the Mabul of the flood, that's why, and with the phenomenon of the Mabul, the world what became inclined, right? So therefore, what happened is that you might ask, where did all the water go? It couldn't all evaporate. Well, actually, we see that right after the flood of Noah, it starts mentioning the seasons. So that's what the Sforno says. Before that, there were no seasons. It was tropical weather all over. And the seasons came after. Why? Because God put the earth from straight to inclined. And being that it's now inclined, as we all know, the sun does not reach the extremities, the pole, the north and south pole, in the same way. And therefore, all the water accumulated and froze in the poles. And that's why we are so scared of the global warming. We don't want to go back to a situation, God forbid, of flood. Anyways, that was just for the information since we're speaking about Noah. So, we find that it is the year 600 of the life of Noah, the sources of water of above and below opened up. On this statement, the, para, the Parashat Chayi Sarai, if I'm not mistaken, it mentions the following. The Zohar says, so too, in the year 600 of the 6th millennium, we, the world, will experience a flood again. What will happen? the supernal knowledge of above is going to come down on the earth and the knowledge of science of below is going to come out of the earth and the world will be submerged with an immense knowledge and this will be a preparation for the coming of Mashiach if you calculate the 600th year of the 6th millennium corresponds to the year 5600, which corresponds to the year 1840. When you hear that date, 1840, what do you think about right away? You think about the Industrial Revolution. That's what you think about. So we see that suddenly the world started changing. There was a real revolution at the level of the world, as the level of how we operate things. And a lot of inventions were created during that time. At the same time, in the spiritual world, something, something very special happened. The Rebbe Rashab in the year 1890 established the first yeshiva to study both the secrets of Torah and the revealed aspect of Torah. Now, this was not a common thing before. In a yeshiva, you would study only the revealed aspect of Torah. The secret aspect of Torah would be reserved to an elite. It wasn't at the reach of everyone. And here, Baruch Hashem, it became something which is established in this world. So suddenly we had something of the knowledge, the supernal knowledge of above, and the knowledge of below, right, that connected together. So slowly but surely, 
right? This was uh, started, this started, this process started. Likute Torah, the teachings of Admur Azaken, the first Chabad Rebbe, were published in a way that all these secrets of Torah were now uh, available for the world. Now, this is a very known Zohar. What people don't know so much is that if you look in that Zohar, you will continue in the Zohar and it says something else. It says that not only from the year 1840 there's going to be a revolution in the spiritual knowledge and in the secular knowledge that's going to hit the world, but every 60 years till Mashiach comes, there's going to be a quantum leap, a quantum change that's going to bring the world to a higher level of refinement, to a higher level of knowledge, secular and spiritual, to prepare it even more to Mashiach. And when you hit the 60th year, it will make whatever was known before look completely obsolete. So, my dear friends, let's make that exercise of the Zohar Kadosh and let's try to look at what happened during this period of time. So, I don't have to tell you what happened from 1840 to 1900. This is the industri Industrial Revolution, as we said before. And spiritually, we know what happened. So now, let's continue. What are the inventions... One second. The inventions that were done, what happened in the... 1900s, 1840 plus 60 is 1900, so between 1840 and uh, 1900 we invented the zipper, we invented the escalator, we uh, invented the, the gramophone, right, we invented the camera film, right, and now we're going to look for the inventions in the 20th century. The radio, television, the transistor, the laser, the electric refrigerator, right? The personal computer. So these are things that happened between 1900 and 1960. You're going to tell me, but what happened spiritually that was so special during these years that shows that the supernal knowledge of above got closer to us because the world is elevating itself, has more tools to receive the spiritual knowledge, and there's more spiritual knowledge which is being imparted. There's a spiritual phenomenon, a godly phenomenon that, that takes over the world. If I asked you, when did the Torah come to America? In what period of time? Before 1900, there was no Torah in America. Between the years 1900 and 1960, which is the second branch of 60 years, when all these creation, uh, these cre uh, these inventions were made that I just mentioned, this is the time that all of the Jews from Eastern Europe that were the main centers of Torah came to America. So here again a great revelation. Amongst them came the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe after escaping Russia, after being persecuted and sentenced to death and then his sentence to death was was transformed into an exile for 70 years, which was eventually transformed to a liberation because of his spreading Torah in a communist Russia at the time, comes to America. So when, when did the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, arrive in America? 
he arrived, <clears throat> right, he had a first visit in 1929, but he arrived in America June 23rd, 1941. Very interesting. As a leader of world jury, he arrives in 1941. Right, so now what happens? He starts a revolution. He starts this whole concept, which is familiar to us, of sending shluchim, sending emissaries all over America, starting with Morocco, believe it or not. That was his first emissary. And he starts spread, spreading Judaism. This is a time, right, you can imagine, 1941, we're in the middle of the Second World War. Uh, Eastern Europe is, is, is going up in flames. And here there's a Jew, as a leader of the Jewish people, which put his life on the line to save Russian Jewry, now comes to America and introduces the concept of outreach in 1941. And he introduces it to people which are going through a crisis. He passes on in 1950. 1951, the Lubavitcher Rebbe takes his mission, the mission of the previous Rebbe, which is to establish a home for Hashem here in America, and he takes it to a new level. And for the next 10 years, till 1960, the Rebbe will imbue the world with this message and start a movement of teshuva. So here from the year 1900 to 1960, we have a transformation that happens in the, in the uh, industrial aspect, in the technology aspect, and in the spiritual realm. Again, the world is becoming more refined. I'll give you an example. I myself, when I arrived in Miami, there were two kosher restaurants. Today, I don't have to tell you in Miami how many kosher restaurants are they. Just like to mention the UN. When did the UN move to New York? Anybody knows? The UN office moved to New York in 1951. Interesting. This is exactly the time that the Rebbe took the mantle of leadership. And many times the Rebbe was asked, why exactly are you in New York, not in Israel? And the Rebbe explained, because New York has an influence on the whole world. This is a central area that has an impact which is even greater than being in Israel. When we talk about the impact we can have on the world. So again here we see that the world is getting more refined. So now we're in 1960. We said that every 60 years the Zohar says there's going to be a quantum change that's going to bring the world to a new state of secular knowledge and godly knowledge. A godly transformation from the year 1960 to the year 2020. What happened? This is when the Teshuvah movement started. After the Lubavitcher Rebbe started a movement of outreach, everyone, even those who criticized him, fought against him, ended up starting their own outreach movements. The Torah has been translated in so many languages like never before the Talmud in French, in English, in Korean it's been translated. The hippies by hundreds and thousands did Teshuvah and became more observant, came back to their roots. During the Six Day War, the Yom Kippur War, we saw tremendous miracles happen in the land of Israel. Later on, during the Gulf War, 
we have seen the revelation of Hashem come closer and closer to us and us come closer to Him. Meanwhile, I don't have to tell you that all the technology, the internet, and uh, the mobile, and uh, what happened in the last 60 years from 1960 to 2020 makes whatever happened before that completely obsolete. Today, students that go to university to study a subject that will take them four years to study, by the fourth year, uh, they're already further than the students that came when they were in their third year. Because there's so much knowledge. Today, the amount of knowledge there is in the world is tremendous. Anybody and everybody can access thousands of classes. So we see here that again, a transformation in the world is occurring. What is this for? It's to get us closer to that day where it's just going to be normal for everybody to recognize Hashem. And we will be able to reach everyone to recognize Hashem. What happened in 2020? 2020 is a year <laughs> that we all know about. I traveled on the plane coming from New York and landed at 2 o'clock this morning. And I want to tell you, it was such a pleasure to, to travel without my mask. The year 2020 brought about Corona. Now, I want to tell you, the fact that it was called Corona is not by accident. Corona comes from the word crown. Spiritually speaking, this is a very, very high level which is revealed to the world. The crown represents what we say in Sefer Yetzirah, in Kabbalah, the concept of Oneg Ha'elyon, the great pleasure of above, the supernal pleasure, godly pleasure. The word Oneg in Hebrew, which is spelled with three letters, Ein, Nun, Gimel, the Sefer Yetzirah says that if you interchange the letters order, you change the letters order, you will see that it spells the word Nega, a blemish, a sickness, an external sickness. Now, the word Nega, Oneg, how could we have Oneg, which is such a high level, the crown of God, right? The crown of the revelation of Hashem transform itself into what's called a nega, something which is a blemish. Not only that, Moshiach himself is called in the Talmud of Sanhedrin, is referred to as a person which is the leper. Leprosy, not the way we know it, but leprosy as a sign which is from above, a skin condition. Why is he called like this? Because Mashiach, which is supposed to be the individual which will redeem the Jewish people, receives from above the concept of the Oneg Ha'elyon, the crown of Mashiach, the crown of Hashem. But being is not a vessel for it. When you receive too much of something, instead of being a healing, it becomes a sickness. And that's how it becomes a nega, a blemish. And it's interesting because the law in Parashat Azriyah Metzorah that we read a few weeks ago, the halacha is that a leper has to wear a covering over his mouth. As it says, Al safam yate. Now, this all seems very familiar to all of us. To wear a mask on our mouth. So, we find here that during this period of time there is a spiritual process which is happening of a higher level of light which unfortunately we are not vessels to receive. So unfortunately what happened, happened. But at the same time, what happened in the world? The Zoom class we are having today 
is a direct result of 2020. Suddenly, people don't want to go in the streets to go to work. Suddenly, the world is just like that circle crown, a circle which has no beginning and no end. We are able in that circuit to communicate, to connect, to receive words of Torah, to give words of Torah, to receive them. The world's level of knowledge and connection between two polar opposites, Australia, Canada, and uh, Asia, and so on and so forth, it's suddenly the whole world is becoming one. And now we're going to virtual reality, we're going into other stuff that's happening in the world. All this is a preparation. It's a preparation to the great Shabbat. Now, Mashiach, according to the Rambam, is not going to change anything of the nature of the world. Maybe we could have a deeper understanding and saying that now that the nature of the world has gone to such a level and is continuing to grow from level to level and the spiritual levels are coming down here to meet with the physical world just like at the moment of Matan Torah, of the giving of the Torah. So this is what it means that the world naturally is going into this period of fusion between the two trees, the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. <clears throat> so now, where are we in the picture? Well, in the picture, we have to change and put ourselves into sync. We have to put ourselves into sync and start, you know, adjusting things. Meaning that Hashem, for example, told us we can't mix milk and meat. When we understand that when you have a wire, even you have a wireless connection and you're missing a dot, or you have the wrong letter, the wrong code, you can't connect. In order to be able to be vessels to this light of Hashem, we need to make certain changes in our life. certain transformations. We need to just adjust ourselves. It's not much. The Torah wasn't given to us in order for us to just be great intellects and to be known for the great Jewish brain. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to be in fusion with Hashem. And in order to do that, when you keep kosher, you start with the home, separating milk and meat, and slowly but surely, you know, only having kosher food, you are putting yourself in a situation where you are becoming more a vessel for Hashem's beracha, Hashem's blessing, and Hashem's connection. When a young or old man put on tefillin, they bond with Hashem. When a woman lights Shabbat candles, we are bringing a light in the world. We have to put ourselves, put ourselves in a state of mind where everything that we do is to prepare ourselves for this great day. They say a story, and obviously it's to be continued. They say a story that there was, there were two brothers. Unfortunately, they got into a fight and they didn't speak for 20 years. Meanwhile, one of the brothers had a daughter that he needed to marry, and Bauch Hashem, the, he found a, a good groom, and he decided to make peace with his brother. So he sent his brother, which wasn't living so far, an invitation. The brother did not respond. He sent him another one. He didn't respond. Each time he would get the invitation, he would look at it and rip it up. The night of the wedding of his niece, the brother decided to take a shower and 
put himself in his pajamas and go to sleep early like this. He doesn't feel the guilt of not going to his brother's daughter's wedding. When the wedding arrived, the brother started his wedding and he sees that his brother is not here. And he says, you know what? Enough with the war between my brother and I. I sent him invitations. He didn't want to come. I'm going to bring the whole procession of the wedding by his house. And he brings the whole procession. Everybody is there. And right there by the balcony, but his brother's balcony, they were celebrating the wedding. The brother is so touched. He couldn't sleep. He was tossing and turning in his bed. He runs downstairs. And he says, my brother, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov, forgive me. Let's be, let's make peace. Let's celebrate this beautiful simcha, this beautiful wedding. The only thing is, suddenly he saw that everyone in the room that came for the wedding was looking at him. And then he realized everybody was dressed for a wedding, but he was still in his pajamas. The Lubavitcher Rebbe announced that Mashiach is coming very soon. Mashiach is already here and just needs to reveal himself. The world is ready. We need to get ready. Mashiach, the wedding between the Jewish people and God, is going to happen. The question is, how are we going to go to this wedding? We will never go to a wedding in pajamas. People spend thousands of dollars to look at their best in order to go to a wedding. This is the wedding you don't want to miss. It's going to happen, but we have to make a part of us. We have to make our part to get ready and to prepare our homes, our children, our families to this great day. Have a fantastic week. Chodesh Tov. A special blessing to my daughter, Chaya Mushka Bat Nechamadina, that she should give birth in good health and everything should go well. And Moshiach should reveal himself already right now. Amen.